engineer, more than any other class, is what makes TF2 Team Fortress 2. That much is obvious just by looking at his buildings. Teleporters to get teammates to the fight quickly, a dispenser to keep them healthy, and a sentry gun to punish enemies that play too aggressively. Engineer is the defensive class, capable of slowing games down to a crawl. He, as well as the medic's ubercharge, are products of Valve's heavy emphasis on pacing. TF2 was designed to be a game with emotional highs and lows. An ubered player pushing into a sentry nest is a rush for both the attackers and defenders. Conversely, the downtime that Engineer can force onto teams as they prepare their next push adds to TF2's casual, even social atmosphere. It's okay to spend some time hanging around the dispenser with your team, or fighting with them over who should use the teleporter next. TF2's unique and addictive pacing is a major contributor to the game's continued success. It's a winning formula, one that's also very easy to mess up. The main source of Engineer's defensive prowess, his sentry gun, needs to be sturdy enough to punish those who play too carelessly. At the same time, his nests should always be threatened by well-coordinated pushes from equally skilled opponents. A truly impenetrable defense isn't fun for either team. In TF2, a stalemate isn't a tie, it's a loss for everyone. Engineer should never be the strongest class in the game, or anything close to it. However, balancing Engineer isn't as simple as tweaking the numbers on his weapons like most other classes. His biggest strength comes from the support of his team, and his biggest weakness is the cooperation of his opposition. To what extent should the winning team be decided by their teamwork? Are all types of teamwork equal? or should some types be rewarded more than others? These are just some of the questions Valve has had to grapple with when designing TF2 and in the many years afterwards. There's no one right answer to any of these questions, but there are plenty of wrong answers that can lead to disastrous consequences. Has Valve been able to steer clear of those consequences? Well, there's only one way to find out. So let's gear up for the evolution of Engineer. Upon TF2's release, Engineer immediately stood out as the premier defensive class. Level 3 sentries were just as powerful as they are today, boasting some of the highest DPS in the game alongside perfect accuracy. They were designed to be the ultimate area denial tool, obliterating anyone unlucky enough to step within their range. To balance out their incredible power, sentries were also designed to be binary in their counterplay. A player running straight towards a sentry will almost always die, but a player chipping away at an unattended sentry from behind cover will almost always get past it unscathed. Any damage dealt to an engineer's buildings is also unaffected by falloff, meaning just about any class can pick off a sentry from outside its range or around a corner. In a vacuum, a sentry can't do much more than punish careless players. It's up to the engineer and his team to take advantage of a sentry's strengths while mitigating its weaknesses. A single scout may be able to destroy a sentry on his own, but not while the engineer who built that sentry is blasting him with a shotgun. It should be noted that although an unattended sentry can theoretically be destroyed easily, it takes time to learn how to do so in practice. Sentries were intended to be beaten by corner peeking, but popping out from behind cover too often will lead to you taking heavy damage. You might think you're outside of a sentry's range, but the only way to confirm for yourself is to get within its line of sight and hope you don't hear that those that played Engineer needed to learn the layout of every map they played on, memorizing not only where every ammo pickup spawns, but also the best spots to build a sentry. A sentry that's out in the open will get destroyed within seconds, whereas a sentry that's too far from the objective will do nothing but collect dust. Knowing where to build your sentry was crucial to playing Engineer effectively, because as soon as you placed it down, it would remain there until someone destroyed it or the round ended. The ability to pick up and to move your buildings did not exist at TF2's launch. Now, this wasn't quite as detrimental to Engineer's effectiveness as it sounds. Players were only just learning how to fight sentries, so even suboptimal spots could lead to plenty of kills. Funnily enough, the voice commands telling engineers to move their gear up was part of the base game, though if an engineer really did have to move their gear, their only option was to destroy everything and start from scratch. This was an annoyance to NG's playing on defense, but so long as they picked a good sentry spot that covered the objective, 
They wanted their sentry to stay there for as long as possible. For NGs on offense, however, the inability to move buildings was a major pain. On offense, your team is constantly pushing forwards, meaning you'd constantly need to destroy and rebuild your sentry to keep up. What about NG's other buildings then? Surely teleporters and dispensers would be helpful for keeping up offensive pressure. Well, back in 2007, teleporters and dispensers could not be upgraded. They were capped at level 1. Teleporters took a grand total of 10 seconds to recharge, while dispensers were stuck giving health and ammo at a disappointingly slow rate. Oh, and those teleporters cost a whopping 125 metal each to build. Were engineers better off ignoring these buildings and focusing on their sentries? Not at all. No one complained about teleporters taking too long or dispensers being too slow because players were happy to have them as options in the first place. But the lackluster abilities of NG's supportive buildings further compounded the idea that he was only worth using on defense. Even there, engineer players were still trying to figure out the optimal way to play the class. Sentries couldn't deal with enemies hiding behind cover, so it was up to the engineer to kill them himself. But in doing so, he'd be leaving his sentry unattended. A level 3 sentry has at most 216 health, which really isn't a lot for something that can't move and isn't affected by falloff. All it took was a few rockets, pills, or even pistol shots to destroy the sentry before the engineer could return in time to repair it. That's not even mentioning Spy, who could destroy a sentry within seconds due to sapped sentries not resisting revolvers like they do today. To those that wanted to protect their sentries at all costs, roaming the map was the last thing on their minds. Instead, most players opted to turtle up and repeatedly wrench their sentry until they died, usually with a dispenser right behind them for infinite metal. Sentries may have relatively low survivability on their own, but with each wrench swing healing them for up to 100 health, a turtling engineer can be flat out impossible for most classes to beat alone. You could try killing the engineer first, but that wasn't always possible when he was hiding behind his sentry and had a dispenser healing him. Turtling as engineer required little thought or skill, yet it could prevent large portions of the enemy team from playing the game. And when there were multiple turtling engineers on the same team, the pace of the game came to a screeching halt. Yes, even from the game's launch, stacking engineer on defense was a popular strategy. A single sentry can be corner peeked or taken out from range, but what if there's a second sentry covering the blind spots of the first? If you take out one sentry, you still need to figure out how to destroy the other one, and by the time you destroy the second sentry, the first one is up and running again. Spies suddenly have a much harder time destroying a sentry when dropping their disguise means instant death to the other one. What really makes stacking engineers so effective though is that engineers can upgrade and repair each other's buildings. Buildings get up faster and stay up for longer when engineers are working together. This was a major draw for the class. Cooperating with your team is what TF2 is all about. It was also a major headache for anyone on the opposing team. Waiting on the sidelines for an entire sentry nest to go down can feel like banging your head against the wall. This was not how Valve wanted TF2 matches to be played. Reading or listening through the developer commentary will reveal that they really hated stalemates. As such, they anticipated the power of turtling as engineer and crafted two hard counters to the strategy. Demoman's Sticky Bomb Launcher was ingeniously designed to be the perfect anti-sentry weapon. Sticky Bombs travel in an arc, meaning they can reach sentries from behind cover. The splash damage from Stickies is also capable of hitting an engineer even if he's hiding behind a sentry. Best of all though, multiple Sticky Bombs can be detonated at once for a massive burst of damage, which can easily destroy any sentry despite its high repair rate. While Stickies were designed to be the counter to sentries, the medic's uber charge was the offensive inverse of them. Building uber, just like building a level 3 sentry, requires protection from your team and takes around a minute to complete. A sentry forces enemies to slow down, while the invulnerability of an uber forces enemies to respond immediately. An engineer can't simply hide behind his sentry to tank it, because he'd get torn to shreds by the uber. And once the engineer was out of the picture, the defenseless level 3 would go down in seconds. So if a team expected an easy win on defense by stacking engineers, they'd run the risk of getting bowled over by the opposing team stacking demos and medics. Should that happen, the defending team would need to think a little harder. Maybe they should have some scouts to disrupt the demos, or a spy to sneak behind them and pick off the medics before they get uber. 
Then the opposing team might respond by getting some pyros or heavies to act as bodyguards. So on and so forth until the superior team wins. This is the underlying genius behind TF2's core design. Certain classes can beat other classes in a way that feels natural and not, for lack of a better term, video gamey. Demo stickies deal the same amount of damage to buildings that they do to players. An ubercharge grants invulnerability to all types of damage, regardless of their source. And yet, these are unquestionably a sentry gun's greatest counters due to the design of the sentry itself. As a consequence of this balancing philosophy, however, altering the abilities of the engineer even slightly could render these counters as obsolete. If sentries ever became too powerful, Valve wouldn't be able to simply buff Medic and Demo even more in response. That would make them way too strong versus everyone that wasn't engineer. Valve was well aware of this. They wouldn't be giving Engineer major changes anytime soon. Engineer was… fine on release. He was designed to defend and he did that well. But defending seems to be the only thing Engineer could do, which was frustrating to those who saw the limitless potential behind the class. To those players, the issue with Engineer was clear. He was too tethered to his own base. This, too, was an issue that Valve was aware of, and one that they'd slowly chip away at. The first notable change to Engineer came in December of 2007. Sentries were given a damage resistance to revolvers when being sapped to prevent spies from destroying them nearly instantly. Don't let the wording of the patch notes fool you, this was a massive resistance. Sapped sentries would now resist 66% of the damage from revolvers. Some kind of revolver resistance was absolutely necessary, as spies were one of the biggest reasons not to stray far from your sentry. December of 2008 came with an even bigger buff. Engineers could finally upgrade dispensers and teleporters up to level 3, both of which were massive improvements over their level 1 counterparts. This was of particular importance to those that attempted to play Engineer on offense. Level 3 dispensers not only kept offensive pushes strong health-wise, but they also served as a rallying point for them. Meanwhile, level 3 teleporters were invaluable for helping attacking teams maintain the territory that they'd gained throughout the match. Taking a mere 2 seconds to recharge, they essentially allowed Engineer to choose the spawn point for his entire team. It's a common sentiment today that teleporters win games, and that's no exaggeration. Teleporters would get another sizable buff in the classless update of August 2009. The Sapper was changed to sap teleporter entrances and exits at the same time, regardless of which end was actually sapped. I had originally thought of this as being a buff to Spy, but in reality it was actually a buff to Engineer. Previously, if a Spy snuck behind your team and sapped the teleporter entrance at spawn, there was nothing you could do about it. Now, the Engineer can remove both Sappers by wrenching the exit next to him, making it much easier to keep teleporters up and running. And those were the only notable balance changes Engineer received for the first two years of TF2's life. They were undoubtedly great changes, but they paled in comparison to what was being done with the other classes, who had been receiving massive dedicated updates with entirely new weapons. December of 2009 saw the reveal of the war update for both Soldier and Demoman, leaving Engineer as the only class who had yet to receive his own update. It should go without saying that engineer usage was low with all the explosives being thrown around. That was to be expected for class updates. Engineer players would just need to wait a few weeks for things to settle down, then everything would go back to normal. Except, that wasn't the case this time, because by the end of the update, Soldier had been blessed with one of the best anti-sentry weapons in the entire game, the direct hit. Dealing 112 base damage, the direct hit is capable of destroying any sentry with just two rockets, rockets that were significantly faster than stock. If a direct hit soldier found a sentry and the engineer wasn't already next to it, the sentry was guaranteed to go down. To engineer players, this was yet another reason to never leave their nest, despite that being what many of them wanted to do. Not every engineer wanted to sit around and turtle all game, Yet it was feeling more and more like that was the only way to play the class effectively. Anyone who dared to roam the map risked the base that they'd put so much time into getting destroyed. To those that wanted to play Engineer more aggressively, building a level 3 sentry felt like a waste of time. And that got some players thinking. Does Engineer really need his sentry at level 3 to be effective? 
Sentries had a tendency to get destroyed the moment you left them, so why even bother upgrading them? What was stopping an engineer from plopping down a level 1 and going to town with a shotgun? From this simple change in mindset, a new playstyle was born, the Battle Engineer. These engineers viewed their sentries as nothing more than disposable tools. If it got destroyed, who cares? It was only a level 1, it took 5 seconds to build another. Enemies wouldn't die to a level 1 instantly, but that's what the shotgun and pistol were for. By no longer caring about their sentries getting destroyed, battle engines were able to build in much more aggressive spots. From there, they'd patrol the area around it, knowing that any enemies within the sentry's range would be stuck fighting in what's essentially a 2v1. Once the area was clear, they'd destroy their level 1 and build another one further up, slowly backing the enemy team against a wall. If the engineer managed to get behind the enemy, he could set up a teleporter and enable his team to attack from multiple angles, a tactic known even as far back as 2009 as ninjaneering. Compared to turtling, Battle Engineer was much closer to how Valve envisioned the class to be played. They wanted engineers to be more active. But the only reason why it worked in practice was because engineers stopped bothering with upgrading or even protecting their sentries, something that Valve likely didn't expect. That's not to say they didn't like the idea of sentries being seen as disposable, though. They'd take note of this growing trend as they finalized their work on the next major update. From TF2's release to the end of 2009, Engineer had barely changed at all, other than upgradable dispensers and teleporters. From an outsider's perspective, it seemed like Valve was actively avoiding the class. Every other class was already getting new weapons and massive balance changes, but not Engineer. Were players clamoring for NG nerfs or buffs? Not really, no. He was strong on defense, but not without his counters. What players wanted was more variety, more ways to play the class other than whacking a level 3 all day. Through experimentation, those same players would eventually find what they were looking for, the Battle Engineer playstyle. However, the advent of this new playstyle only reaffirmed Valve's hesitation. They barely changed anything about Engineer, yet players were able to flip the class's role onto its head. Any attempts to do the same with the other support classes, like Battle Medic, were gimmicky at best because that's not how the class was designed to be played. Battle Engineer, on the other hand, was legitimate. It wasn't the most popular playstyle for Engineer, but the fact that it was good at all shows that Engi and his buildings left a lot of room for creativity. If Valve was going to give Engineer new unlocks, they'd better playtest their ideas as thoroughly as possible. All it took was a few crafty players to take what seemed like a balanced weapon and break the game in half with it. Two thousand ten set the tone for the year in May with an unexpected buff to the engineer, a new weapon, not for him but for Pyro, the home wrecker. It had already been known since the game's launch back in two thousand seven that Pyro was a great partner for engineer. Pyro's flamethrower was the best way to catch spies, who otherwise posed a massive threat to the NG players at the time. Then in two thousand eight came the addition of air blast, which coincidentally stuffed the main counters to a sentry explosives and ubers. However, it wasn't until the release of the Homewrecker that the Pyro-Engineer combination really took off. So what did the Homewrecker do exactly? Well, it actually released in March, but its only stats were increased damage against buildings and less damage against players. It was awful, leading to Valve slapping on an additional perk two months later. The Homewrecker could remove sappers from friendly buildings in a single hit. Pyro was now the perfect partner for Engineer due to the sheer roll compression that the class offered. He can spy check, he can reflect explosives, he can deny ubers, and now he can even remove sappers. This playstyle for Pyro became so popular that it was eventually given its own name, the Pi Bro. A Pi Bro and Engineer formed a defensive core that was extremely tough to break, which was consistent with how TF2 had always worked. An engineer that cooperated with his team forced the opposing team to cooperate in response. Admittedly, a pyro being able to waste precious seconds of an uber by holding down right click is questionable. But assuming the uber recipient was competent, most classes would be able to kill the pyro quickly and still have enough time left for the sentries. 
engineers attempting to tank their buildings would still get killed immediately, and sentries that weren't being repaired wouldn't last much longer. To reiterate, sentries have a relatively low max health. Engineers can repair them quickly, but only by standing next to them. These factors are what allow engineers' counters to, well, counter him. Sentries were designed to be roadblocks. They were not impenetrable walls. That's why Valve gave them such hard counters in the first place. Destroying a sentry nest only required a little bit of teamwork. Protecting that sentry nest would take a bit more teamwork. The balance and effort between attackers and defenders is what kept engineers' defensive capabilities in check. In just two months' time, Valve would destroy this balance beyond recognition. It was July 4th, 2010. Players were going through their mundane crafting routines. Some were turning weapons into scrap metal, others were hoping to craft a decent looking hat. But one player was in for a surprise when they randomly crafted an item that had never been seen before. A golden wrench. Then another player crafted one. And another. The engineer update was finally here. By this point, TF2 had already been out for nearly three years. Why did it take this long for engineer to get his update? Was Valve simply ignoring the class until now? As it turned out, no. Behind the scenes, Valve had been testing new weapons and even new buildings for at least the past year, possibly even longer. One such weapon was the PDQ, which competitive players had tested in TF2's closed beta back in 2009. It boasted a 150% faster construction rate, but was unable to upgrade buildings, something that was clearly inspired by the battle engineers that were gaining popularity around this time. Ultimately, the PDQ never made it into the main game, as losing the option to upgrade any buildings was too severe of a downside, even for more aggressive NG players. In March of 2010, Valve published a blog post detailing an entirely new building that they had been experimenting with, the Repair Node. This would have been a replacement for either the dispenser or teleporter, and could repair any buildings in its vicinity even if the engineer wasn't nearby. As you might expect, the immediate effect of the repair node was making turtling engineers nearly impossible to break through. More interestingly, however, was how the replacement of engineers' supportive buildings ruined the pacing of matches by severely handicapping attacking teams. Without dispensers, they were frailer and less cohesive. Without teleporters, they had a much harder time holding onto their ground, let alone pushing forwards. Two months after this blog post, in an interview with Critzcast, TF2 co-developer Robin Walker delved into yet another idea for Engineer that was ultimately scrapped. A secondary weapon that would have allowed Engineers to teleport immediately to their teleporter exit. Like with the repair node, this damaged the game's pacing by incentivizing Engineers to build their exits in places that made sense for them, rather than their team. Also like the repair node, it made maintaining a sentry nest too easy, leading to Valve dropping the idea entirely. Keep in mind, the PDQ, repair node, and this unnamed secondary were just three of many ideas for Engineer that were playtested extensively, only for them to never see the light of day. Of the ideas that we actually know about, every single one of them attempted to tackle the same problem, Engineers feeling too tied to their bases. And aside from the PDQ, these ideas showed Valve that heavy-handed solutions could break the game in unexpected ways. Yet, after months, if not years of trial and error, Valve was out of time. They couldn't delay the Engineer update any longer. It would release on July 8th with four new weapons for the Engineer. But before we get into those, we first need to discuss one massive change that was made to Engineer himself. As of this update, Engineers could finally pick up and move their buildings. Back when the game first launched, not being able to move your buildings wasn't a major hindrance for NG's playing on defense. By 2010, however, it was an issue. Not only had players gotten better at destroying sentries, but new maps were getting larger and larger, with more and more points to defend in any given match. Being able to move your buildings meant that an engineer with good game sense could now move his nest back before the enemy team pushed in and destroyed it all. The 25% move speed penalty given to engineers hauling their gear ensured that NG players wouldn't be able to simply react to the enemy's pushes and run, as they'd have no chance of escaping by then. 
Playing Engineer on offense was suddenly a lot more bearable now that you could actually move your gear up with your team, rather than needing to destroy everything like before. Particularly aggressive players found level 2 sentries to sometimes be preferred over their level 3 counterparts due to their faster redeploy time, giving enemies less time to destroy the sentry before getting mowed down. For those that died to a sentry, they could no longer be sure that it'd be in the same place by the time they respawned, forcing them to play more cautiously against an engineer that was creative with their sentry placement. The ability to move buildings was exactly the kind of change that engineer needed. It enabled more aggressive and active play without making turtling any stronger than it already was. This was only the start though. Of the four weapons introduced in this update, one in particular was tailor-made for the aggressive battle engine playstyle, the Gunslinger. A spiritual successor to the PDQ, the Gunslinger replaced the regular upgradable sentry with the mini sentry. Minis couldn't be upgraded or even repaired when the Gunslinger first released. They, compared to level 1 sentries, had less health and a lower DPS. But what they lacked in defensive area denial, they more than made up for in offensive pressure. Minis took a mere 3 seconds to build, regardless of whether or not you were hitting it with your wrench, er, hand. They were also deceptively tanky while building, as they not only started with their max health of 100, but they'd also heal throughout their construction if it took any damage. This is in stark contrast to the rest of Engineer's buildings, which start at 1 health and don't reach their max health until the end of their construction. Previously, even the most aggressive battle engineers were forced to build their sentries behind cover and bait enemies into their sentries range for that 2v1 fight. With the Gunslinger, they could now get away with plopping down a mini in front of an enemy. Most classes wouldn't be able to destroy the mini in a single shot, giving the engineer ample time to kill them. If they tried to kill the engineer first, they'd only have 3 seconds to do so before the mini was up and firing at them. Killing the engineer would also take longer than usual, because the Gunslinger granted Engie an additional 25 health, allowing him to play much closer to the front line where his minis were the most effective. Even if you managed to destroy the building, there wasn't much stopping the engineer from building another. They only cost 100 metal, and unlike today, the gibs from a destroyed mini could be collected for churning out even more minis. Once they were built, minis were nothing more than a nuisance and didn't take long to be destroyed. This wasn't something that could single-handedly defend a point like a regular sentry. And it didn't have to. Instead of hanging back to defend, Gunslinger NGs were using minis in conjunction with their own shotgun skills to push forwards with their team, something that many engineers had already been doing for a while by this point. And for those who were late to the battle engineer craze, they could learn the ropes quickly by playing on one of the maps introduced in this update, Hightower. It seriously can't be a coincidence that Hightower and many sentries were added in the same update. Valve knew what they were doing. In addition to extra health and minis, the Gunslinger also had a unique combo mechanic. It couldn't deal random crits on its own, but hitting an enemy three times in a row would cause the third hit to be a guaranteed critical hit. This wasn't particularly useful, but it had its moments. Overall, the Gunslinger was a game changer for Engineer. Yes, Battle Engineer had already been a thing long before this update, but the Gunslinger is what made that playstyle as reliable and effective as Defensive NG. Much of that effectiveness came from minis being overtuned in certain aspects, but Valve would surely be quick to fix that. Besides, a mini sentry was only threatening if there was an NG with good shotgun aim nearby. The stock shotgun was a solid damage dealer, but what if you needed a little more oomph? That's where the next new unlock came in, the Frontier Justice. Upon its release, the Frontier Justice functioned the same as it does today, storing guaranteed critical hits upon your sentry's destruction in exchange for a 50% smaller clip size. The number of crits that are stored depends on how many kills and assists the sentry had gotten, granting 2 crits per kill and 1 crit per assist. From the moment this weapon was revealed, pairing it with the Gunslinger was a no-brainer. Many sentries were disposable, and the Frontier Justice rewarded NGs when their sentries got destroyed. With minis being so easy to spam, NGs playing against an unorganized team had no shortage of sentry kills and assists to convert into crits at a moment's notice. It was an incredibly powerful combination in pubs, although the vast majority of that power came from the Gunslinger. The choice between the Frontier Justice and Stock on Battle Engineer mostly came down to preference. The much more interesting use of the Frontier Justice was on defense, 
There, it aimed to resolve the same issue as the repair node, that of engineers feeling too tethered to their own nests. But whereas the repair node accomplished this by buffing the nests themselves, thereby making turtling too effective, the frontier justice makes the engineer more powerful, but only after his sentry has been destroyed, and only if that sentry managed to get some kills or assists beforehand. Even then, between the reduced clip size and Engie's low health, a crit-boosted Frontier Justice isn't enough to ward off a group of enemies making a coordinated push. Instead, Engineers would need to push up to make full use of their revenge crits, making defensive Engie much more dynamic. The Frontier Justice encouraged Engies on defense to switch back and forth between passive and aggressive play, without rewarding them for turtling all game like the Repair Node had. Many have tried to turtle with the Frontier Justice, saving up a massive horde of revenge crits, only for most of those crits to go to waste once the enemy pushes in to overwhelm the Engie and his nest. Instead, it's better to destroy your sentry yourself to occasionally harass the enemy with crits and foil their attempts to organize a push in the first place. The Frontier Justice was and still is an excellent side grade, allowing engineers to be a bit more active even when playing on defense. Continuing this trend of making NG more engaging to play as, the Wrangler was a new secondary that allowed Engineer to take full control over his sentry. By taking the Wrangler out, any sentry the Engineer had built would no longer aim automatically. Instead, it would fire at wherever the NG pointed his crosshair, shooting bullets with Mouth 1 and rockets with Mouth 2. Why would you want to give up the sentry's already perfect aim? Recall how sentries were designed to be binary. They had a limited range and slow turning speed, both of which could be exploited by more patient and experienced players. The Wrangler changed this. If someone was attempting to corner peek your sentry, you could wrangle it and make it keep firing bullets and rockets at that corner to scare the enemy off. If someone was shooting at your sentry from outside his range, taking the Wrangler out would suddenly give your sentry infinite range. To anyone that still wasn't convinced, the Wrangler would also double the sentry's DPS, and even slightly increase the rocket launch rate of level 3s. In theory, these are the ingredients for a great side grade. The Wrangler allows intelligent engineers to work around the limitations of their sentries, but in doing so, it forces them to rely on their own aim and to get a line of sight on their targets, which can put them at greater risk of getting killed. In practice, however, there were a few design choices behind the Wrangler's manual aim that made it slightly overtuned. First and foremost, aiming the Wrangler wasn't truly manual. There was a built-in aim assist that would lock onto the center of enemies. Now, the Wrangler needs aim assist in some capacity, otherwise trying to aim with a gun that isn't firing from your point of view would feel too inconsistent. But the aim assist of the original Wrangler was much, much more accurate than it had any right to be. So long as you pointed your crosshair at the general direction of an enemy, the Wrangler would do the rest of the aiming for you. Second, the damage dealt by a wrangled sentry was not affected by falloff. This had actually been the case for all sentries since CF2 first released, but it wasn't much of an issue until the Wrangler gave sentries infinite range. The lack of falloff, combined with the egregious aim assist, allowed the Wrangler to easily dish out up to 256 DPS at any range. All of a sudden, engineers wanted to build their sentries in more open spots, they didn't have to worry nearly as much about enemies shooting at the sentry from out of its range. The Wrangler, combined with the ability to move buildings, led to an explosion of creative new sentry spots on every single map. Some of the most common spots you still see in matches today are only effective because of the Wrangler. But the best sentry spots at the time were the ones you can't replicate today. After the release of the Wrangler, players immediately took interest in what would later be dubbed sentry jumping. By firing the rockets of a level 3 at your feet, or the bullets of any sentry up from underneath you, engineers could easily and immediately reach places they were never intended to. Since Valve didn't expect NGs to reach these spots, they never bothered turning the terrain into no-build zones, which is how they prevent NGs from building in, say, their team spawn room. This wasn't the first time players figured out how to build in places that Valve didn't want them to. Throughout the first few years of TF2's life, there were a number of crazy spots that Valve had to go back and fix, but those spots were limited to places that Engie could reach on foot, and often took minutes of setup time. Sentry jumping was faster and launched Engies further, though once an engineer made it to a hard-to-reach spot, he'd still need time to set up a teleporter and move his sentry up there, 
giving enemies plenty of time to kill the engineer or destroy the teleporter. I mean, it's not like you could sentry jump and pick up your sentry at the same time, right? As it turned out, yes, yes you could. How long did it take players to discover this? Not even a week after the update launched. The timing was tight, but there was also a script that did it for you. With this tech, Engineer players took no time at all breaking maps left and right, discovering new sentry spots that were flat out unfair to fight against. And for every broken sentry spot, Valve would need to go back into their maps and fix them one at a time. Were engineers abusing these spots in every single game? No, but those that did were capable of walling the enemy team out single-handedly, much to their aggravation. Despite having such a simple concept, the Wrangler changed a lot for Engineer. With it, sentries were more powerful, had longer range, and could be built just about anywhere. But we've definitely covered everything regarding the Wrangler, so we can finally move on to the fourth and final new unlock, the Southern Hospitality. It, unlike the other new unlocks, was dead simple. Hitting someone would cause them to bleed for 5 seconds in exchange for no random crits and a 20% fire vulnerability. Clearly, the bleed effect was meant to help NGs track down spies by themselves, which it was decent at, and not much else. The upside was negligible, but the fire vulnerability downside was hardly a factor either, since pyros aren't known for their sentry-destroying capabilities. The best they could do was reflect a level 3's rockets, which dealt explosive damage, not fire. This put the Southern Hospitality in an odd place balance-wise, because its only other downside was not being able to deal random crits. On servers with random crits enabled, this was a meaningful downside. Engineers are notorious for getting crits regularly with their wrenches, which can kill most classes in a single shot. On servers without random crits, however, the Southern Hospitality didn't really have any downside, so it was arguably a straight upgrade to stock, but only on those servers. And its upside was so minuscule that no one really cared whether it was a straight upgrade or not. Either way, one thing was certain. It looks really cool. And with that, I think we've covered everything from the Engineer update. This was possibly the most influential class update in TF2's history, which was fitting considering it was the last of the original class updates. Engineer was given so many new options that it was impossible to thoroughly explore every one of them in the weeks or even months that followed. Engineer was no longer bound to hiding behind a level 3 all day. Players could experiment with their own unique blends of offense and defense. Some aspects of Engie's new offensive tools were in need of being scaled back, but that was fine. If Valve needed to tweak some numbers later down the line, so be it. They ultimately had one clear goal for the Engineer update, to make the class more engaging and active to play as without inadvertently causing more stalemates in the process. And honestly, Valve nailed it out of the park. After months of troubled beta testing, the Engineer update really did make NG more engaging without making mindless turtling any more powerful. Is what I would say if it wasn't for a single unlisted stat on one of Engineer's new unlocks. Upon its release, the Wrangler was initially viewed as a purely offensive tool. Its only listed stat was the ability to manually control your sentry, so that was the only thing it was used for. But when players tried using the Wrangler for the first time, they undoubtedly would have noticed this team-colored sphere. Say hello to the Wrangler's shield. It appears the moment you take the Wrangler out, and blocks a whopping 66% of damage dealt to the sentry. A level 3 normally maxes out at 216 health. By pressing 2 on his keyboard, an engineer can suddenly give that level 3 an effective max health of 648, meaning you'd need to deal the equivalent of 648 damage to destroy it. This shield breaks just about everything that had kept engineer's defensive capabilities in check. The sentry's relatively low max health was the linchpin to everything. It's what allowed burst damage, either through coordinated focus fire or with stickies, to easily muscle through a nest. It's what forced engineers to stand next to their sentries and repeatedly repair it, putting themselves at risk. 
It's what enabled Uber pushes to turn sentries into scrap within seconds. And yes, it's also what disincentivized most NGs from ever leaving their nests. But Valve had already tackled that issue in this update. If you built your sentry in a bad spot, you could now move it rather than helplessly watch it get destroyed. Or if it was in a good spot and it racked up a few kills before going down, the Frontier Justice would turn that loss into an opportunity for you to get even more kills. Having a hard time getting a level 3 up in the first place? Go Gunslinger and take matters into your own hands. The Wrangler Shield was yet another solution to this issue. Taking the Wrangler out made a sentry more resilient even if the engineer wasn't nearby to repair it. But unlike the Frontier Justice or the Gunslinger, the Wrangler also made turtling significantly more powerful by using it primarily for its shield. The enemy team would need to work significantly harder to take down a sentry that was being wrangled. Demos needed to lay at least six stickies rather than just two or three. Direct hit soldiers were literally incapable of destroying wrangled level threes on their own if the engineer was also repairing it. Oh, that's right. Sentries could be repaired while they had their shield up. Just switch away from the Wrangler, and the shield stays up for an additional 3 seconds, giving the NG plenty of time to wrench it. And unlike today, there was no repair penalty. Every wrench swing repaired 100 health even if the shield was up, in which case it effectively repaired 300 health with the absurd resistance factored in. Of course, an engineer repairing his wrangled sentry meant it wasn't firing at anyone, but it only took a little over half a second for the NG to whip the Wrangler back out should anyone attempt to rush in and punish him. Or if the engineer wanted to keep the shield up for even longer, there was nothing stopping him from taking the Wrangler out for a split second before switching back to his wrench. This was already ridiculous for one engineer, but the Wrangler shield also made stacking engineer even more powerful than it already was. Wrangled sentries taking so much more time and effort to destroy meant that any other engineers on the same team were granted more time to build and protect their own buildings, even if they themselves weren't using the Wrangler. Engineers could also repair each other's wrangled sentries, allowing those sentries to fire with infinite range and zero falloff while being healed. If you managed to kill the NG while he had the Wrangler out, his sentry would be disabled for 3 seconds. But in a bizarre balance decision from Valve, the shield would persist throughout those three seconds, so unless you were a class that could deal hundreds of damage within that time frame, you were forced to retreat and slowly chip away at the sentry from behind cover. All of this was for an unlock that replaced the pistol. Don't get me wrong, the pistol is a nice tool for harassing enemies from afar, but truly, an engineer had very little to lose and so much to gain by equipping the Wrangler. It would have been a perfectly fine side grade with the manual control alone, but the addition of the shield made the Wrangler flat out overpowered. Being able to increase your sentry's health with the press of a single button was broken on a fundamental level because it went against everything the class had been balanced around. Despite this, the vast majority of engineer players did not abuse the Wrangler shield to the fullest. Not yet, at least. Most NGs at the time simply used the Wrangler to control their sentries, they viewed the shield as nothing more than a nice bonus. It would take some time for NG players to realize just how powerful that shield really was. With the Engineer update finally released, players had no shortage of new toys and mechanics to experiment with. Unfortunately for Valve, this meant that their work was far from over. I'd already mentioned the slew of broken sentry spots that were made possible with the Wrangler, which Valve would need to fix in their maps one at a time. But what was far more pressing were the many, many bugs and exploits that this update introduced. Now, every update is bound to have a few bugs here and there. That's the reality of working with spaghetti code. The bugs that arose from the Engineer update were not your regular bugs. Seriously, look at some of these patch notes. July 9th fixed an exploit that allowed engineers to build level 2 or 3 mini-sentries. July 13th, fixed an exploit where engineers could create level 3 mini-sentries. October 18th, fixed an exploit that let NGs build multiple sentry guns. Fixed engineers being able to build level 3 minis using the Wrangler. October 19th, fixed another exploit that let NGs build multiple sentries. Fixed NGs being able to build level 3 minis using the Wrangler for real this time. 
This was likely another reason why the engineer update was saved for last. Giving an already complicated class multiple new mechanics at once was practically guaranteed to cause a mess of game-breaking exploits. In spite of this, Valve managed to release a fifth and final new unlock for the year in the Australian Christmas update of December. That new unlock was the Jag. Upon its release, the Jag granted a 30% faster construction rate in exchange for a 25% damage penalty. That construction rate perk should sound familiar, because it's the same perk that the PDQ had. The original PDQ was not worth using, so how did the Jag fare? Unfortunately, it wasn't much better. A 30% boost may sound impressive, but it wasn't coded properly. That 30% was simply added to the default 90% construction boost, which, due to how math works, led to the construction rate of the Jag actually increasing by just under 16% when compared to stock. The Jag only saved 1.5 seconds with the dispensers or teleporters, and not even a full second with sentries. This did not make up for the Jag's damage penalty, which notably allowed spies to survive two non-crit swings. Well, you might be thinking, what if you used the Jag to set up your buildings and switch to another wrench afterwards? That may have been useful if it wasn't for the fact that switching wrenches would automatically destroy all of your buildings. This had actually been the case since the Engineer update first added unlockable wrenches, but neither the Southern Hospitality nor the Gunslinger had stats that would incentivize players to switch wrenches mid-life like the Jag did. Why did this mechanic exist? Well, it was likely added as a band-aid fix to whatever bugs were being caused by switching wrenches back when all of these unlocks were being tested by Valve. In any case, the original Jag failed to make much of an impact, though that was probably for the better considering some of the other unlocks that were added just five months prior. Three years after TF2's launch, Engineer finally got his update, and boy was it a good one. Between the four new unlocks and the ability to move buildings, Engineers could now play more aggressively and with greater flexibility, which was exactly what the class needed. What he didn't need, however, was for turtling and engineer stacking to be even more effective, which the Wrangler could do in the hands of those that knew how to abuse its shield. That's not to say Engineers' new offensive options were perfect either. The Gunslinger had quickly become one of the most hated weapons in the game for how difficult it was to punish mindless mini-spam, and the Wrangler's long-range damage output was unreasonably high due to the lack of falloff. All in all, however, the Engineer update was a successful one. Some unlocks were undoubtedly overtuned in retrospect, but as I've said, this wasn't immediately obvious to most players. Let's just hope that Valve addresses these problematic unlocks before adding any new ones. After an entire year of beta testing and bug fixing, Valve fittingly avoided making any further changes to Engineer for the first eight months of 2011. The Uber update, which introduced more weapons than any other update in TF2 history, came and went without anything of note for the Texan. Valve, with their usual brand of sarcastic self-awareness, even acknowledged the fact that they were avoiding the class in a secret update page. It wasn't until August that Valve returned to the drawing board for Engineer with the release of two new unlocks, the Widowmaker and the Short Circuit. The Widowmaker was statistically the same as the stock shotgun, but with one key difference. It used Engineer's metal as ammo, rather than having its own clip to reload. Any damage dealt with the Widowmaker would be returned as metal, potentially allowing an Engineer to fire indefinitely. Originally, each shot with the Widowmaker cost 60 metal. This was way too much. You could only afford to miss three times before running out of metal. Two months later, Valve would quietly lower the cost to 30 metal per shot. And just like that, the Widowmaker became an excellent side grade. At first glance, the Widowmaker may seem like a straight upgrade so long as you hit all your shots, but this isn't actually true. Having it equipped leaves you in an awkward position of deciding whether or not to use all of your metal for building and upgrading. For example, if you wanted to build a mini and dispenser, doing so would leave you without a primary weapon. Pairing the Widowmaker with the pistol is practically mandatory for this reason, which means you're giving up the absurd defensive capabilities of the Wrangler. As such, the Widowmaker is a playstyle-dependent weapon, 
Its upsides only outweigh the downsides when playing aggressively, aka on Battle Engineer. The Gunslinger's extra health and cheaper sentries allows NGs to make the most out of the Widowmaker, putting out a constant stream of damage that can easily suffocate unprepared teams. At the same time, NG's poor mobility ensures that despite how powerful an infinite clip shotgun was, he wouldn't be outclassing Scout as a pure combat class. The Widowmaker was and still is an excellent unlock. Perfectly balanced and mechanically interesting, what's not to love? The Short Circuit, curiously enough, was a secondary that also used metal as its ammo supply. Unlike the Widowmaker, however, the Short Circuit was a defensive tool. At the cost of 35 metal, firing the Short Circuit would destroy any projectiles in front of the Engineer, as well as slightly damage any nearby players. This was a concept that could have broken the class. Explosives had always been one of an Engineer's biggest threats, and now he could simply delete them on his own. Thankfully, the weapon was kept in check by its high metal cost and relatively slow firing speed of 0.8 seconds. For most projectiles, it would be more metal efficient to simply allow your buildings to take the hit and repair it afterwards. The short circuit was at its most useful when clearing sticky traps or any other cluster of explosives, since there was no limit to how many projectiles could be destroyed with a single shot. It was also nice for protecting yourself or your team from spam, especially when pushing the payload cart, which would supply you with infinite metal. The short circuit was a balanced weapon, which was a welcome surprise seeing how potentially game-breaking such a concept could have been. Despite this, it was rarely used because its role as a defensive secondary was completely overshadowed by the Wrangler. The Wrangler had been out for over a year by this point, and more and more players were catching on to the fact that the best part about the Wrangler was its shield, not the manual control. That was fine though. Valve didn't need to change anything about the short circuit if they wanted players to use it more. All they would have to do is give the Wrangler a much needed nerf. Skipping ahead to December, Valve would bless Engineer with yet another pair of new unlocks, the Eureka Effect and the Pompson 6000. Like today, the Eureka Effect's alt fire allowed engineers to teleport to their spawn from anywhere on the map. This concept should sound familiar, because one of the scrapped weapons for the engineer update had been a teleporting secondary, although that weapon would have brought NGs to their teleporter exits. The ability to teleport back to spawn had great potential. Engineers could use it to get metal, maintain teleporters, or retreat at the cost of temporarily abandoning their base. Of course, the Eureka effect needed some sort of downside, and the one it had on release was massive. Engineers using this wrench could not move their buildings. This was a perfect showcase of just how much the game had changed since its launch. And by that, I mean the Eureka effect wasn't very good. Not being able to move your gear felt much more limiting in 2011 than it had back in 2007. Maps were larger, players were more experienced, and games were faster paced. Keep in mind that all of this was still back when switching wrenches would destroy all of your buildings, so it's not like you could use the Eureka effect at the start of a life and switch from it once your base was built. As such, the Eureka effect was rarely used. The Pompson 6000 was a new primary weapon that functioned much like the Righteous Bison. It shot projectiles that couldn't be reflected, didn't require ammo, and could penetrate players, potentially hitting each player multiple times. The projectile, despite having a deceptively large hitbox, was slow, meaning it was nowhere close to the stock shotgun in terms of reliable damage output. Dealing damage was not the main use of the Pompson, however. Its projectile had two additional effects on hit, draining a spy's cloak by 20% and a medic's uber by 10%. This, uh, this was a terrible idea. Draining Spy's Cloak was hardly an issue, but doing the same to a medic's uber? That was game-breaking. 10% may not sound like much, and it really wasn't. It would only take the medic a few seconds to get it back. But those few seconds often made the difference between an enemy push being successful or not. When a good medic gets uber, they don't pop it immediately. They first push up with their pocket, saving their uber until they reach whatever choke point they're trying to break through. While pushing up, the medic is putting himself at risk of getting ambushed. Should that happen, the medic may need to use his uber early to save himself. You know, pop it, don't drop it. If a defending team turtled the entire round and refused to leave their base, 
enemy medics would have no issue building Uber and saving it for the perfect moment. The pumps then changed this. Now, a turtling engineer could mindlessly spam down a choke from the safety of their nest. Any medic that turned the corner at the wrong time would lose their Uber and likely die as a result. Even if they hid behind their pocket, the projectile would still pass through and hit the medic. The Pompson was nothing more than a middle finger to medics that were doing what Valve had originally designed the class to do, build Uber and break stalemates. It wasn't fun to play against, and it certainly wasn't fun to use, since the most effective way of using it was spamming from behind your sentry. This was blatantly terrible weapon design, yet it would take Valve nearly 8 months to do anything about it. Even then, all they did was remove the player penetration in August of the following year. This really didn't change anything for medics. They had more than enough to worry about. Being on the lookout for that incredibly hard to spot projectile and hiding behind their pocket if it was heading towards them was not worth the mental energy. That's not even mentioning the possibility of there being multiple pomps and engineers all spamming down every possible path. Valve also felt the need to slightly boost the damage to compensate for the projectile no longer hitting multiple times. But dealing damage was never the main use of the Pompson. People were using the Pompson to delay, if not flat out deny Ubers for free. Giving Engineer of all classes the ability to take away a medic's Uber was inherently game-breaking. Just like how giving Engineer the ability to triple his sentry's health was game-breaking. This class was balanced around having clear counters and limitations, which were now being circumvented by some of these new unlocks. It's understandable why Valve was doing this. Many viewed Engineer as a frustrating and boring class to play as when TF2 first launched. It wasn't very fun feeling tethered to your base, only to watch helplessly as an Uber tears everything to shreds. Most of the weapons that aimed to fix this issue were well balanced, but with every new unlock introduced, there was the potential for another Wrangler or another Pompson. Whether they were aware of it or not, Valve was inching closer and closer to making sentries practically indestructible, which was the very thing that they were trying to avoid. With that being said, how much more could Valve even do with Engineer? Being able to drain Uber was already pretty out there. Like, what's next? Being able to repair buildings from across the map? Or, or being able to move buildings from across the map? <laughs> Wait. Released in the mecha update of December 2012, the Rescue Ranger was a new primary that caught everyone's attention. It fired bolts that, upon hitting a friendly building, would repair them regardless of how far away they were. That's not all though. By right-clicking with the Rescue Ranger out, any building you aimed at would instantly teleport into your arms. Just like that, a massive limitation that had been placed on Engineer since the game's launch was shattered. The class would no longer need to be standing right next to his buildings to repair them. What were the implications of this? Well, for starters, Engineers could now actually leave their nests to scavenge for metal and scout the area for threats. If their sentry started taking damage while the NG was away, they could heal it from afar, or even yoink it out of danger if need be. If the engineer was already at his nest but taking splash damage from explosives, he could step away and continue to repair his buildings from an angle that was impossible for the enemy to reach, which also made it impossible for spies to pull off a stab and sap. Tanking your sentry with the rescue ranger was especially appealing because doing so cost zero metal. So this weapon shattered yet another hard limitation, that of needing metal to keep your buildings up. Metal conservation has always been an important part of playing Engineer effectively. Balancing your metal between building, upgrading, and repairing was a skill in and of itself, a skill that now seemed obsolete with the Rescue Ranger. Teleporting buildings, infinite range repair, repairing for zero metal cost… Yep, this certainly sounds like one of Valve's signature blatantly overpowered weapons, the kind that haphazardly negated a class's intended weaknesses. Yet, astonishingly, the Rescue Ranger was not overpowered. It was not underpowered. It was… actually balanced? Valve must have been fully aware of how ridiculous the Rescue Ranger's perks were utility-wise, because the weapon was made to be absolutely pitiful offensively. It had a clip size of 4 rather than 6, and each shot dealt a pathetic 35 base damage. You were giving up a lot of self-defense to use this thing, which was further compounded by the weapon's other main downside. NGs would be marked for death when hauling buildings, even if they hadn't used the Rescue Ranger's alt-fire. 
If you were using the Rescue Ranger, you lived and died by your sentry, which made Spy a particularly effective counter to the weapon, since sapped buildings couldn't be repaired via bolts. A Rescue Ranger engineer without a sentry was quite possibly the least threatening thing in the entire game. The Rescue Ranger did make it harder for enemies to destroy that sentry in the first place, but not to an unreasonable degree. Once you looked past those blue stats and into the raw numbers, you'd find that the perks of the original Rescue Ranger were actually quite modest. Each bolt only healed up to 50 health, which was half of the wrench's 100 health per swing. And using the Rescue Ranger's alt fire cost a whopping 130 metal, meaning you'd need to be on point with your metal conservation skills to actually use that mechanic. The Rescue Ranger was a marvel of weapon design. Valve must have felt pretty damn good, releasing a weapon that had the potential to break the game in half, yet it was adored by practically every NG player, and even many of those who had previously never enjoyed the class. The amount of creativity and freedom it allowed for was limitless. Engineers finally felt like they had full control over whether or not their buildings went down, no matter where they were on the map. However, with the release of the Rescue Ranger, Valve had, in fact, just broken the game in half. Whoa, whoa, wait, didn't I just spend the past few minutes gushing about how surprisingly well-balanced the Rescue Ranger was? Yes, the Rescue Ranger on its own was fine. The problem was, the Rescue Ranger was a primary weapon. There existed a secondary for Engineer that complemented the strengths of the Rescue Ranger perfectly a secondary that was already overpowered on its own. Despite their best efforts, Valve had accidentally made sentries impenetrable. I've already talked at length about how absurd the Wrangler was, but the Wrangler paired with the Rescue Ranger was a completely different beast. For engineers playing on defense, the Rescue Ranger's meager self-defense was only an issue when your sentry was down or you were outside its range. The Wrangler made sentries three times harder to destroy at the push of a button and gave your sentry infinite range. The Wrangler's shield could be summoned from anywhere on the map, but at least engineers still needed to put themselves at risk and stand next to their sentry to repair it. Except not anymore, because the Rescue Ranger now lets you repair buildings from any range. And with that shield up, each bolt from the Rescue Ranger would effectively heal 150 health. From any range, for zero metal, all by pressing 2 on your keyboard and firing at your own stationary sentry. How about those crazy sentry spots that the Wrangler had enabled? Well, with the Rescue Ranger, players no longer needed that script to get sentries into those spots quickly. Obviously, the script was still preferred since it didn't cost any metal, but many players didn't even know that script existed in the first place. And once that sentry was up, engineers would no longer need to remain in that precarious spot, as the Rescue Ranger let them repair it from afar. The Wrangler and Rescue Ranger covered each other's weaknesses and made each other's strengths even better. The end result was a level 3 sentry that had an effective max health of 648, infinite range without falloff, could be healed by 300 health per wrench swing, or 150 health from any distance for zero metal, could be hauled away from any distance, and could be set up just about anywhere on the map. Comparing this to the level 3s from the game's launch is downright comical at this point. Players had gotten better at fighting sentries since then, but individual skill can only get you so far. Sentries were designed to be binary after all. You either have the weaponry and positioning to destroy a sentry, or you don't. End of story. This was fine in 2007 because in addition to general strategies like corner peeking and circle strafing, there were mechanics and classes that were designed to keep Engineer in check. And here's where we're at now. The class with the highest DPS in the entire game, with 8 seconds of invulnerability is no longer enough to destroy a single sentry. Now, just to be clear, the Rescue Ranger Wrangler loadout was not a direct upgrade in all situations. Engineers using these weapons together had no means of defending themselves without their sentries. On game modes like, say, King of the Hill, this arguably kept the loadout in check. 
You could build a level 3 in front of your spawn, but how are you going to move it into an actually useful position when you have no way of protecting it or yourself while it rebuilds? Where this loadout was an issue was on defense. There's setup time at the start of every round, allowing NGs to get a head start on their nests before the gates even open. If the enemy team manages to break past your defenses, no matter. With a little game sense, you can fall back and have your nest fully rebuilt in time for defending the next point. And if playing on payload, to the many points following that one. Engineers on defense could force the Herculean task of muscling past a wrangled sentry onto the enemy team, over and over and over again. I've realized that I'm preaching to the choir here. Today, the Wrangler is near unanimously considered to be overpowered. Today's Wrangler is a heavily nerfed version of the original, mind you, but we'll get to that later. So surely players were up in arms over the Wrangler back in 2012 once engineers really started to abuse the thing, right? Actually, no. Many, possibly even the majority of players at the time, actually defended the Wrangler being as strong as it was, for the simple reason that breaking wrangled sentries wasn't outright impossible. It just required teamwork, which meant it was A-OK -okay in this team-based shooter. Here's the problem with that argument. In a vacuum, Wrangler engineers don't actually require any teamwork to beat. A demo can take all the time he needs to lay eight stickies and destroy everything. A spy can sap the sentry and gun the defenseless NG down by himself. This, however, doesn't make the Wrangler balanced because games aren't played in a vacuum. In an actual game, a single player is going to have a much harder time taking out a wrangled sentry because the engineer has up to 11 other teammates with him. A demo taking the time to unload his entire clip of stickies is very vulnerable, and easy pickings for anyone who catches him off guard. Same goes for a spy going for a suicidal sap in the middle of an entire defending team, or for a soldier that's spamming rockets in hopes that one of them will be a random crit. But that should be fine because the engineer is working with his team, right? Not necessarily. The engineer might actually be communicating with his team, which should be encouraged and rewarded. But the Wrangler forces players to invest so much time into destroying a single sentry that more often than not, random stragglers attempting to break that sentry seem to magically disappear on their own. In reality, they get forced out by the 11 other defending players that are simply playing the video game by spamming down a choke point or looking for frags. There are only so many corners to peek from or flank routes to take for any given sentry spot, meaning a player can only harass the sentry for so long before getting interrupted. This may still be teamwork, but it's a shallow type of teamwork, and it's nowhere near the level of coordination that's actually required to break that nest. To break a wrangled sentry, Anything less than an uber push is unlikely to make much of a dent. Even an uber push that's executed with perfect timing is no longer guaranteed to break a sentry, not even close. An ubered demo might have enough time to lay down seven stickies and destroy the sentry, but what if there's a pyro there to air blast him or his stickies away? What if the choke they need to push through forces the medic to pop uber a few seconds early? What if the demo tries to kill the engineer first, but he's hiding behind his teammates or in spawn? What if, even after exhausting an entire clip of stickies and a full 8 seconds of uber, there's still another level 3 that's remained untouched? Again, you could argue that these are all examples of the NG working with his team, but it's a type of teamwork that requires little effort or communication. Think about it like this. When you play on payload defense and your team is pushed to last, do you need someone to tell you that stacking engineer would be the best way to win? No, because everyone that's played TF2 for more than 5 minutes already knows this. When the enemy push fails to destroy more than one of your sentries, is that because you and your fellow engineers planned ahead and mapped out which spots would cover the most amount of area? Probably not, since laying out multiple sentries that aren't literally right next to each other will get the job done. Communication and coordination with your team would make your defenses even stronger, but the issue is that you can still get pretty damn close to that ideal defensive hold without exchanging a single word, while the enemy team is forced to exert that level of effort. All because of an engineer using the Wrangler on defense. Or, god forbid, there being multiple Wrangler engineers on defense. Sentries on their own were never meant to be the walls preventing the enemy team from pushing. The wall was the defending team, and the sentry was what buffered that wall by preventing anyone from slipping through the cracks. This is no longer the case. 
Wrangled sentries are now themselves a wall, one that doesn't require much skill or coordination to maintain unless there's a massive skill gap between the two teams. If teams are evenly skilled and not coordinating, the defending team with wrangled sentries will win. If teams are evenly skilled and are both coordinating effectively, the defending team with wrangled sentries will still win. So no, wrangled sentries weren't literally undestroyable. No one actually thought that. The issue was the disparity in effort between destroying that sentry versus maintaining it, and how that disparity only grew in the situations where Engineer was already strong enough. The Wrangler was overpowered, and the Rescue Ranger, despite being a fine weapon on its own, made the Wrangler even better. Five new weapons were released between 2011 and 2012. Among them, two were well-balanced, one was blatantly poor weapon design, and one was fine on its own but made a previously overpowered unlock even more broken. It finally happened. Despite their best efforts, Valve had accidentally made Engineer too strong. The keyword there is accidentally. With the exception of the Pompson, all of Engineer's unlocks showed some level of restraint. There wasn't anything as overtly overpowered as, say, the Tomislav. A weapon like that could be fixed pretty easily by tweaking some of its numbers. The same couldn't be done for Engineer's unlocks. It was impossible to predict how any changes made to NG could affect the game as a whole. The Rescue Ranger Wrangler combo was unquestionably overpowered, but that was okay. Valve simply didn't anticipate just how strong that combination would be. All they would have to do is see the extent to which experienced NG mains were abusing these unlocks. They may not have been able to anticipate this abuse, but they could certainly go back to fix it. The summer update of July 2013 was notable for being the first major rebalance update for Engineer since his own update back in 2010. Everything between then and now had been new weapons, bug fixes, and the occasional buff or nerf. The dust had settled. Valve was finally ready to re-examine Engineer and make whatever changes they deemed necessary. And would you look at that? One of the weapons on the chopping block was the Wrangler. As of this update, the Wrangler's aim assist would be nowhere near as egregious as it had once been at long range. Okay, that was the easiest issue with the Wrangler to spot, but you gotta start somewhere. Next, the Wrangler's shield would now fade away one second after the owning engineer died, as opposed to covering the full three seconds that the sentry was disabled for like before. Oh, that's cool. So now players have two seconds to destroy a shieldless sentry before it starts firing again, right? I... oh... Oh no. So, the shield still protects the sentry throughout its disabled state, but now it only takes a single second for the sentry to start firing on its own again. This was, frankly, a terrible decision. The Wrangler did not need any buffs, yet it arguably received one. The only substantial nerf that the Wrangler had actually received was the reduced auto-aim. This was absolutely necessary. But part of what made the Wrangler so devastating at long range was the lack of falloff. Was Valve gonna do anything about that? Nope. These were the only changes that were made to the Wrangler. Don't get too mad at Valve though, because the Rescue Ranger was also changed in this update. Maybe they tweaked it to not be as broken with the Wrangler? Well, the first thing Valve did was increase its damage by a measly 14%, with it now dealing 40 base damage instead of 35. This was a fine change, the Rescue Ranger was still pitifully weak, just slightly less so than before. Second, healing via the Rescue Ranger was increased from 50 per bolt to 75. Oh no, no 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 no, did they seriously just make the Rescue Ranger even better without nerfing the Wrangler? Because now, with the Wrangler's shield up, every bolt from the Rescue Ranger would heal an effective 225 health up from the previous 150. Do you know what this means? Valve had no idea what players were capable of doing with these unlocks. No sane person would have looked at an experienced NG using the Wrangler and Rescue Ranger and thought to themselves, hmm, this should be even stronger. Yet that's what happened. The Rescue Ranger Wrangler combo was just buffed significantly. Unsurprisingly, 
It was after this update that word about the combination spread beyond just veteran NG mains. The strategy of tanking a wrangled sentry with the rescue ranger would even receive its own name, the Sigafu Save, named after the player that helped popularize it. Even without the Wrangler, healing 75 health at any range for zero metal was extremely powerful. With the Wrangler, well, need I say any more? First major balance update for Engineer in three years, and Valve managed to make the class's most overpowered loadout even more busted. This update also came with a nerf to the Gunslinger. Oh my god, that's right! This entire time, while Engineers were stonewalling entire teams on defense, they were also annoying the hell out of people on offense with the Gunslinger. The main complaints made against the Gunslinger was that it was unreasonably hard to punish an Engineer that was spamming minis across the map. Since the Engineer update back in 2010, those minis automatically started at 100 health and healed themselves throughout their 3 second build time. As of this update, minis would no longer heal during construction, which had apparently been a bug this entire time. This was a good start, but it barely made a difference when it came to punishing mini spam. Gee, I sure hope it doesn't take Valve another three years to nerf the Gunslinger for real, because people are really starting to get upset over it. The last weapon to be changed in this update was the Short Circuit, which was given two buffs. Its old 35 metal cost was bumped up to 36, but only when it failed to destroy a projectile or hit a player. If a shot from the short circuit did accomplish one of those two things, it would only cost 18 metal. Its firing speed was also increased by 25%, around once every 0.6 seconds, which was now faster than rocket launchers and as fast as grenade launchers. The short circuit was already decent when it first released back in 2011, so why did Valve feel the need to buff it? Well, recall how despite being a useful secondary, the short circuit wasn't actually used much at all. Why? Take a wild guess. Yeah, it's possible that Valve saw the short circuit's low usage and equated that to short circuit bad instead of there's no reason not to use the Wrangler. Thankfully, these buffs were pretty modest all things considered. The short circuit was now very good, potentially very annoying to fight against, but not overpowered. Let's just hope that Valve doesn't see the continued low usage of the short circuit as evidence that it needs any more buffs and they buffed it again. Smithsmith 2013 came with yet another pair of buffs for the short circuit, just five months after the previous ones. And these buffs were the same as from last time, only more extreme. The short circuit's firing speed was lowered from 0.6 seconds to 0.15 seconds, and its cost dropped to a mere 5 metal per shot. That varying metal cost, depending on whether you missed or not, was completely scrapped. Now, there was nothing stopping you from holding down Mouse 1 and preventing the two explosive classes from playing the game. Soldiers couldn't even rocket jump away from you because you'd delete their rocket before it hit their feet. All the while, you're whittling away at their health because, oh yeah, the short circuit also deals damage. Demo men and soldiers without a shotgun could be beaten very easily and very consistently by getting in their face and spamming the short circuit. No aim or timing required. For engineers that preferred to hide behind their sentries, this new short circuit was extremely useful to them as well. Whether you like it or not, projectile spam is good for softening teams up and making it harder for them to withstand a push. Turtling engineers had very little reason not to delete whatever projectile came their way resulting in more stalemates as the enemy team failed to make progress with their pushes. It didn't take long for Valve themselves to realize their mistake. They'd give the short circuit a handful of nerfs throughout the winter of 2014, most notably making every projectile destroyed cost an additional 15 metal, as well as preventing metal gain from dispensers while active. However, the issue of being able to hold down Mouse 1 in front of an explosive class's face was still there. The short circuit would continue to frustrate those that played against it, but for the time being, Valve was ready to sweep it under the rug. Three months later, in June of 2014, Valve would attempt to buff yet another underused unlock, the Eureka Effect. This had been widely considered to be the worst wrench due to its crippling inability to haul buildings. With this update, that crippling downside was removed. In exchange for another crippling downside, Repairing and upgrading rates would now be cut in half. This was laughably counterintuitive. 
any time that was saved by teleporting to spawn would be wasted by your nest taking 10 years to build. On the bright side, engineers could now choose between teleporting to their spawn or to their teleporter exit, which was funny considering that that's what led to the unnamed secondary being scrapped way back in 2010. Was it an issue in 2014? Not really. Maybe Valve's playtesters were just a bunch of jerks. It's worth noting that this new Eureka effect reinvented a playstyle that had been part of the game since day one, the Ninjaneer. An NG that slipped behind the enemy could now continuously pester them from behind with the Eureka effect and a well-hidden teleporter exit. This probably wasn't how Valve intended people to use the weapon, but hey, at least it was actually being used for something. The Eureka effect would remain as Engineer's worst unlock, and it could be argued that it was even worse than before. After supposedly buffing Engineer's worst unlock, Valve would proceed to nerf Engineer's best unlock just one week later, the Wrangler. Yep, here we are again. Last year's Wrangler nerf failed to accomplish much. Valve tried making it less powerful at long range by nerfing the auto-aim, but that alone wasn't the issue. It was the lack of falloff that let NG snipe players from across the map. So what did this year's nerf have in store? It gave Wrangled Sentries damage falloff. Huh. In the patch notes, Valve specified that the falloff from a sentry's bullets would be calculated from the sentry's position rather than the engineer's. This is because a level 3's rockets, unlike its bullets, had always had ramp up and falloff, but those were based on the position of the engineer himself. It was probably the result of Valve copying code from Soldier's Rockets, which calculate ramp up and fall off in the same way, but it really wasn't an issue for Engineer. Valve finally nailed what was making the Wrangler so oppressive offensively, and it was now perfect in that regard. It lets Engineers deter enemies from a distance, but not outright kill them like before. With that being said, however, what made the Wrangler so oppressive defensively wasn't touched and basically hadn't been touched since the weapon's release back in 2010. So although the Wrangler was indeed nerfed, it was still the Wrangler. Skipping ahead to December, Engineer would receive his final new unlock, the Panic Attack. This was a shotgun that could hold up to four shots and fire them in rapid succession, with its fire rate and weapon spread increasing as your health decreases. It wasn't very good. You could try to make it work on Battle NG or maybe Ninjaneer by sneaking up behind people and blasting them with pellets, but the fact that you were forced to fire after loading four shots ruined what little ambush potential this weapon had. It was disappointing, especially in retrospect now that we know that this was in fact the last new NG unlock. Don't worry though, because this video is far from over. After 2014 came 2015 a year that should be notorious for its massive balance changes. Something big was in store for Engineer, but before we get into that, let's first assess the class's balance by this point in the game's life. Engineer has always been strong on defense, but some of his unlocks were taking that strength to a whole new level. Tripling your sentry's health, deleting projectiles, repairing buildings from any distance for free, draining uber, Granted, a single engineer couldn't do all of those things at once, but that leads into the next issue, engineer stacking. It had already been an effective tactic since the game's launch, but engineer's best unlocks only made class stacking even stronger. It took an unreasonable amount of effort to destroy one wrangled sentry or one turtling engineer spamming the short circuit slash Pompson, let alone multiple. NGs didn't even need to coordinate on which unlocks to use because any combination would do. Half Wrangler, half Short Circuit? Sure. All Wrangler or all Short Circuit? Why not? Rescue Ranger, Pompson, it didn't matter. You could use whatever unlocks you wanted and your team's nest would still be nigh impenetrable because there would almost never be a time when those unlocks weren't useful. Fighting sentry nests practically required both explosives and ubers by this point, and the aforementioned weapons could easily hamper one if not both options. So by 2015, Engineer was way too powerful defensively because he forced the opposing team to work significantly harder than him. Offensively, the class wasn't perfect either for the exact same reason. The Gunslinger was still causing headaches due to how hard it was to punish mindless mini-spam. Okay, so Engineer was overpowered on defense and unreasonably strong on offense as well. Time to break out the nerf hammer, right? There was just one issue the spectrum of playstyles between pure offense and pure defense. 
it was practically non-existent. If you weren't running the Gunslinger, you were turtling on defense. Any attempt to make Wrench Engineer work in an offensive context was a grueling endeavor. It was better than when the game first launched, but there was still a lot to be desired. This wasn't the worst issue for a class to have. Engineer is a specialist after all. He's not supposed to be the ideal choice in every situation. It did, however, leave Valve with an important question. Where should they take the class from here? If they nerfed Engineer across the board, then great, he'd no longer be overpowered on defense. But then we'd just be back at the start, where NG was only good on defense. If they buffed the class across the board, then that would allow for much more expression and flexibility. But that would also make turtling even better, a lesson that Valve themselves had learned with the repair node back in 2010. The best outcome for Engineer would be to tone down his extremes while fleshing out and improving the options between those extremes. How would Valve do that exactly? It wouldn't be easy, that was for sure. Many of Engineer's issues were rooted in how the class had originally been designed. Fixing those issues would require something akin to a reworking of the class. And in the Gunmetal update of July 2015, that's exactly what Valve did. Nearly every aspect of Engineer was changed in this update, arguably even more than in his own update back in 2010. And as we all know, the Engineer update wasn't perfect. Would Gunmetal share the same fate? There's only one way to find out, so let's jump right in, starting with a long list of changes made to Engineer himself. As of this update, construction boosting was increased by 50%, meaning a building being wrenched by an engineer would now build 50% faster than before. This alone was a massive change, but Valve didn't stop at speeding NG up here. The speed penalty from hauling buildings was also reduced from 25% to 10%, essentially going from heavy's move speed to demos. And when hauling teleporters and dispensers, those buildings would redeploy an additional 50% faster, leading to them rebuilding in just under 4 seconds when wrenched by an engineer, down from the previous 6 seconds. Valve just made Engineer a lot more flexible, being able to get his gear up and move it wherever it needs to be much faster than before. This made the class much more effective on offense even without the Gunslinger. Did these changes also make turtling even better? Not really, because most of these changes were for moving your gear, which was something that turtling NGs weren't keen on doing. Also, notice how although all buildings benefited from the wrench boost buff, only NG support buildings got an additional redeploy speed buff. Rebuilding your sentry still took just as long as before, taking 5.3 seconds without wrenching it. Wait, what? So sentries also who got a redeploy buff? That wasn't listed in the patch notes. Here's what happened. Another part of this update was changing the actual formula that determines construction time. One such change was calculating multiple construction boosts additively instead of multiplicatively. That's just a fancy way of saying that buildings would no longer go up near instantly if there were three or more NGs wrenching it, which was how it had been up until Gunmetal. This rarely came up in your average unorganized pub, but hey, Valve actually nerfed engineer stacking. So how did this make sentries redeploy faster on their own? Well, the new formula adds any construction boost to the base rate of 1. The boost given for redeploying sentries is 2. So before gun metal, redeployed sentries built twice as fast. But with this new formula, they redeploy 3 times as fast. So yeah, even sentries were now faster to build and move, which was more good news for those that wanted to play NG aggressively. To those that wanted to turtle, sure, this meant that they could also get their nests up and running faster than before. But those nests would also be harder to keep up. Repairing 100 health per wrench swing would now cost 33 metal, up from the previous 20. The passive resistances that sentries have against revolvers and miniguns was also lowered. The revolver resistance, which only kicked in when the sentry was being sapped, was slashed in half, dropping from 66% to 33%. As for the minigun resistance, that was active at all times, and it had been in place since the start of the game. I didn't bring it up because even with that resistance, heavies still shredded through sentries at close range. But after heavies love and war nerf from 2014, which added damage ramp up to miniguns, this was no longer the case. 
Lowering the sentry's minigun resistance was more so to counteract that heavy nerf, though once a heavy had been firing for more than one second, they'd be ripping through sentries even faster than before. No matter, NGs could still tank ubered heavies with the Wrangler, right? Oh, damn it! It only took five years, but Valve finally nerfed the Wrangler's shield. Well, the shield itself still has its absurd 66% resistance, but the sentry behind that shield would now have a reduced repair rate for both ammo and health. Those rates were reduced by 66%, the same as the strength of the shield. Valve also reverted their terrible decision from 2013, where wrangled sentries were disabled for a single second if the engineer died. Now they'd be disabled for three seconds, the same as if the NG switched off from the wrangler. This was a massive nerf. You could no longer heal wrangled sentries for hundreds of effective health points at a time, making them more vulnerable to prolonged fire than they'd been before. Engineers that over-relied on the Wrangler put themselves in the awkward position of constantly needing to repair their sentry or replenish its ammo, which could lead to them crumbling to constant pressure from the enemy team. All of this was well-deserved, but why did it take Valve five years to get to this point? Well, when you look back at the Wrangler's balance changes, they're oddly meticulous. The weapon was released in 2010 and went untouched for three years, giving Valve plenty of time to observe how it was being used. The most glaring issue with it was its long-range damage output, which Valve attempted to indirectly fix by nerfing the Wrangler's auto-aim. Then they waited a year and saw that the Wrangler was still killing people from across the map, so they finally tackled the root of the issue by adding damage falloff. Then they waited another year, bringing us to gunmetal. The Wrangler was now fine offensively, but busted defensively, so Valve has yet again attempted to fix the issue indirectly. The shield is still stupid, but repairing the sentry behind that shield is less effective than before. This isn't how it typically goes for weapons that have undergone several nerfs. Usually, Valve tries reworking them at some point to steer them away from what was making them so overpowered originally, like slashing the Dead Ringer's damage resistance but giving it a new speed boost, or the Extinguisher's burst damage being reworked to be dependent on Afterburn rather than a flat minus 195, making it useful solely as a finishing tool and not just one-shotting people on its own. Or, you know, they could also just kill the weapon and call it a day. Not the Wrangler, though. Valve seemed dead set on preserving their original vision for the weapon as much as possible. Why? This is just speculation on my end, but I think, to Valve, the Wrangler is a way of future-proofing engineer. Sentries are stupid, which means they're exploitable. What if players got so good at exploiting a sentry's weaknesses that they were hardly even deterred by them? Valve had originally wanted engineers to solve this issue with their shotguns, but that didn't always work well in practice. The Wrangler serves as an additional way that engineers can make up for the limitations of their own sentries. Regardless, the Wrangler finally got the nerf that it deserved. Some feared that these nerfs were too harsh, but those worries were dispelled pretty quickly in the weeks that followed. Being able to manually control your sentry will always be useful, and that absurd shield is the cherry on top. If anything, these nerfs may not have been harsh enough. Was the Wrangler still overpowered after gunmetal? We'll come back to that thought later, but for now, Valve did good. After the Wrangler, the next unlock to be nerfed in this update was the Gunslinger. Like the Wrangler, the Gunslinger was also an incredibly important unlock for the class. It had been enabling the Battle Engineer playstyle single-handedly up until this point. It had also remained as one of the most frustrating things to fight against in the entire game since 2010. The issue was how easy minis were to spam, and that's precisely what Valve went after. As of Gunmetal, minis would heal during construction once again, but they would start at just 50 health as opposed to 100. Their base construction rate was also nerfed significantly, going from 2.9 seconds to 4.2. But for the first time, minis could now be wrench boosted, which would build them even faster than before at 2.6 seconds. Also for the first time, minis could now be repaired once they were constructed. Lastly, the gibs from a destroyed mini could no longer be picked back up for metal. Mindless mini spam was officially dead. If you tried plopping down a mini in front of an enemy now, they would have a much easier time destroying it and turning their attention to you. 
or killing you first and having enough time to destroy your mini before it could even go up. You could get your mini up faster by hitting it, but that meant you were dealing zero damage until the mini was up. What made the old gunslinger so frustrating was how NGs could immediately force enemies into a 2v1. Now, you have to start building your mini before encountering an enemy. Crazy concept, I know. This was a big nerf, but it was aimed exclusively at what had made the original gunslinger overtuned. To those that hadn't been spamming minis, they weren't affected nearly as much. Being able to repair minis was also a pretty substantial buff to NGs that actually put thought behind their placement. It gave them a lot more mileage out of a single mini, which saved time and metal in the long run. The Gunslinger's nerf was done with surgical precision, and it was left in a perfect state. Is the Gunslinger still annoying to fight against? Sometimes, sure, but that's the point of the class. Engineer is supposed to make you slow down, and, depending on your own class choice, rely on your own team. You've gotta hand it to Valve. They've been on a roll with this update so far. Next up on the chopping block was the Pompson, which should need no introduction. Removing Uber from any range was a bad idea, and giving that mechanic to the class that benefited the most from it was an even worse idea. As of Gunmetal, the Pompson's Uber and Cloak drains would now decrease over distance. Engineers wouldn't get anything out of spamming the Pompson from across the map anymore, you now need to be close to the medic to remove any significant amount of uber. As the class with no means of closing that gap, using a weapon that deals pitiful damage and feels like garbage. Yeah, this change immediately killed the Pompson, but no one was complaining. If you've ever wondered why the Pompson is such an awful weapon in modern day TF2, this is why. The last weapon to be nerfed in this update was the Short Circuit. Its spammy primary fire was left intact, but it would no longer delete projectiles. That mechanic was moved to a new alt fire, which cost 15 metal per shot and had a half second cooldown between uses. If you've ever wondered why the main use of the short circuit is done with mouse 2, this is why. I don't know why Valve didn't switch the buttons around, or why they thought anyone would use the primary fire in the first place, but this was a change for the better regardless. However, the short circuit was back to costing the same amount regardless of how many projectiles were deleted, and 15 metal every half second was still pretty cheap and pretty fast. It was undoubtedly nerfed overall, but the previous iteration of the short circuit left a bad taste in people's mouths. The Wrangler, Gunslinger, Pompson, short circuits… yep, that was basically every NG unlock that needed to be scaled back. And with the exception of the Pompson, all of these unlocks were still good after their nerfs. As for the unlocks that were never good, they too were addressed in this update. The Panic Attack was buffed. It still sucked, moving on. The Eureka Effect's crippling penalties were removed for the second time, and were replaced with a third set of crippling penalties. Although, these penalties weren't nearly as bad as the previous ones. The Eureka Effect's construction boost was lowered by 50%, meaning it would take a few seconds longer to get your buildings up when wrenching them. Additionally, any metal received from pickups or dispensers would only yield half as much metal as usual. These downsides were still harsh, but they were at least a bit more conducive to the Eureka Effect's design. Getting less metal from pickups could be worked around by teleporting to spawn, for example. Unfortunately, a bug fix involving Eureka Effect NGs losing their revenge crits had the unintended side effect of making teleporting to spawn no longer replenish health and ammo. But on the rare map that didn't have resupply cabinets in every spawn, NGs could still refill their metal with a loadout changing bind. The reduced metal yields, alongside the construction boost penalty, meant that the Eureka Effect still forced players to waste time that they otherwise wouldn't have to. Thankfully, Gunmetal also introduced a massive change to Engineer that I'd been saving until now. Switching wrenches would only destroy your buildings if their type was changed, which effectively just meant your sentry when switching to and from the Gunslinger. Otherwise, all of your buildings would remain as they were before switching wrenches. With this change, the Eureka Effect could occupy an entirely new niche. It was now the go-to wrench for getting your nest started, namely during setup time. Once your exit was up, you could teleport back to spawn at any point to change your wrench and refill your metal. Now, if only there was a wrench that specialized in upgrading buildings quickly. Enter the Jag. This wrench had been utterly unimpressive since its release back in 2010, 
its faster construction perk didn't work as advertised due to a misunderstanding of how percents work. With Valve changing the formula for construction boosts in general, they took this as an opportunity to finally fix the jag. Now, that 30% increase really was 30%. Well, it's not the build time itself that's 30% faster, but the base construction boost that's now properly increased by 30%. I know, math sucks, but point is, the Jag's sole perk now works in a way that makes sense. Although, that faster build time would no longer be the Jag's only upside, because Gunmetal blessed it with a second perk, a 15% faster swing speed. This let engineers upgrade their building significantly faster than with stock, which synergized perfectly with the Jag's pre-established role of getting those buildings up faster in the first place. A faster swing speed also meant repairing your buildings faster, which Valve thankfully realized ahead of time. They gave the Jag a 20% repair penalty, which, when combined with the faster swing speed, put its healing rate per second slightly below that of stock. What Valve didn't realize, however, was that a faster swing speed also allowed the Jag to remove sappers faster than any other wrench leading to it being a bit too powerful. The faster swing speed also arguably reduced the old damage penalty, but you would need to hit someone with your wrench multiple times in a row for that to be the case, which wasn't realistic in any serious match. This jag was a massive improvement over the previous iteration, and finally gave offensive engineers a wrench that wasn't the gunslinger. Getting sentries up more quickly meant that sentries going down was less of an issue, allowing for more aggressive sentry placement. For this reason, the Jag paired particularly well with the Frontier Justice, which had previously been the only Engineer unlock to successfully straddle the line between aggressive and defensive play. Yes, there was also the Wrangler, but that didn't fill in the gap between offense and defense so much as it made both extremes even stronger. The Jag, on the other hand, was able to fill that void through the flexibility that it granted to players, making it an excellent new addition to Engineer's kit. The last unlock to be buffed in this update was the Rescue Ranger. Wait, the Rescue Ranger? Did that really need any buffs? Well, considering its pairing with the Wrangler had just been nerfed considerably, sure, why not? The buff given to the Rescue Ranger was modest. The cost of its alt fire was lowered from 130 metal to 100 metal. Now, engineers could move two buildings with 200 metal, or move one building and set up a dispenser afterwards. This was a fine change, especially since by 2015, most of the ridiculous sentry spots had been fixed. Most of them. But now that the Wrangler's shield had actually been nerfed, there was still the question of what to do with the Rescue Ranger. Was pairing it with the Wrangler its only issue, or did it still need to be nerfed even after this update? Only time would tell, but for now, it was in a much better spot than it had been previously. I wasn't kidding when I said that Gunmetal was a massive update for Engineer. Valve had two clear goals, to scale back the class's overbearing strengths on both offense and defense, and to offer more options between those two extremes. Did Valve achieve those goals? Absolutely. There wasn't a single change for NG and Gunmetal that wasn't justified. The buffs given to Engineer made him faster and allowed him to more easily adapt to changes in game state, without making turtling any better. Even if those buffs did marginally benefit turtling, the playstyle was undoubtedly nerfed overall, thanks to Gun Metal also scaling back the unlocks that were making sentry nests so difficult to break. This was a near-perfect balance update for the class. Granted, I say this with the benefit of hindsight. No one, not even Valve, had any way of knowing whether Gunmetal's nerfs were harsh enough, or if the buffs had gone too far. It would take some time to see what players were capable of doing with these changes. How much time? Apparently, around 5 months, because the Tough Break update of December sought to revisit some of Gunmetal's NG changes. Following its buffs, the Jag had quickly established itself as the go-to wrench and was practically a straight upgrade from stock. The trade-off for getting buildings up faster was supposed to be having a harder time maintaining those buildings, but the Jag's repair rate was too close to stocks to make much of a difference. Tough Break gave the Jag an additional damage penalty against buildings, now requiring three hits to destroy a sapper rather than two. That made perfect sense, since, again, the downside of the Jag was supposed to make your buildings harder to keep up. 
But wait, did that really make much of a difference against spies? It's a half second longer to remove sappers, sure, but as soon as that sapper's gone, any spy without his disguise is toast. Well, Tough Break also blessed spies with a well overdue buff. After removing a sapper from a sentry, there's now a half second's delay before the sentry can start firing again. Up until this point, spies using their revolvers after sapping were essentially turning the interaction into a gamble. Now, spies can react to their sappers being removed and choose between placing a sapper again, fleeing, or finishing the sentry off if it's at low enough health. The rescue ranger, like the jag, was also nerfed following its buff from gunmetal. Its healing per bolt was lowered from 75 to 60. Now, a full clip would heal 240 damage as opposed to the previous 300. This was another justified nerf. Valve had originally buffed the heal rate back in 2013, likely before they even knew about the Sigafu save. So they nerfed the Wrangler's heal rate in gunmetal, waited 5 months, and sure enough, the Rescue Ranger was still a bit too strong. After this nerf, the Rescue Ranger was still the go-to primary for defense, but muscling past sentries that were being tanked by it was now a bit easier than before. Tough Break also included an engineer change that arguably benefited the Rescue Ranger. Sentries brought into the respawn room would no longer detonate outside of MVM. This had been a thing since 2012, when MVM first released. It made sense there since all buildings redeploy instantly. But as for the base game, it was just annoying. Maybe Valve kept it in fear that NGs would make last defenses too strong by pulling their sentries back into the spawn, but such a tactic proved to not be very impressive once Tough Break was released. All that changed was engineers being able to move their sentries more easily on certain maps, in addition to no longer destroying sentries accidentally, of course. The last change for NG was to the panic attack, which would no longer fire automatically. You could now hold those four shots indefinitely. Wait, that actually sounds good. What were those buffs from Gunmetal again? Faster fire rate, faster reload speed, faster switch to speed. Those buffs weren't enough to make the panic attack worth using then. But now, Tough Break's panic attack was pretty good. It was nowhere near as reliable as the stock shotgun overall, but in situations where you could sneak up behind people and unload all four shots at once, the panic attack was surprisingly lethal. This made it a unique addition to Offensive Engineer's arsenal, admittedly one that bordered on the gimmicky side. But for battle engines or ninjineers that often found themselves behind enemy lines, the panic attack was finally an option worth considering. With NG's final unique unlock having been released in December of 2012, the years that followed were unsurprisingly packed with balance changes. Valve was in the process of revamping the entire class in an attempt to enable more active and aggressive playstyles without inadvertently making turtling even stronger. This had always been Valve's goal for NG, but not to the same degree as these later years. They weren't just giving NG more offensive options anymore, they were toning back his defensive options as well. 2015's Gun Metal was the first time ever that Engineer's defensive capabilities were scaled back. Not an unlock being nerfed, not an exploit being fixed, no. Metal costs for repairing buildings were now higher across the board. Granted, that was a relatively small nerf to the class's baseline stats. But then you look at the nerfs that were given to the unlocks. The Wrangler, the Pompson, the Rescue Ranger, and the Short Circuit. All nerfed in 2015, and all for making Engineer too powerful on defense. Essentially, Valve was beginning to steer NG away from the role that they had originally envisioned him as. It seemed like they wanted him to be less about defense and more about team support, which would explain the massive speed boost that the class had just been blessed with. Despite those buffs, Engineer was far from being truly reworked. He was still incredibly powerful on defense, just as he was when the game first launched. But the fact that Valve was making any semblance of effort to reshape the class's role nearly 10 years into the game's life was exciting. Of course, there are only a handful of balance changes left past this point, so let's see if Valve went any further in their quest to revamp Engineer.
Picking up where Gunmetal had left off, the Meet Your Match update of July 2016 blessed engineers with another massive buff. Teleporters would now cost 50 metal each, down from the previous 125. For the past 9 years, NGs had been forced to dump 250 metal to get an entrance and exit built. You couldn't even have that much metal all at once, so players had to spend even more time searching for ammo before their teleporters were up and running. And yet, teleporters were still more than worth the efforts to build in the vast majority of cases. They had always been an invaluable tool for helping teams maintain territory far beyond their spawn. When that spawn was constantly changing, however, that's when maintaining teleporters wasn't worth the effort. 5CP has always been the most hostile game mode to engineers. This is partly due to the tug-and-war nature of 5CP. There won't always be enough time to get a full nest up before needing to move it forwards or abandon it and fall back. 5CP maps also tend to not have many ammo boxes, since the competitive players that design many of these maps aren't the biggest fans of Engineer. With Valve reducing the cost of teleporters, Engineer suddenly had a much easier time keeping up in 5CP, or faster paced games in general. If you needed to destroy your old teleporters to set up new ones, so be it. 100 metal for an entrance and exit was easy to manage. Even without picking up any metal along the way, you can set up a dispenser or mini sentry afterwards. This seemed like an incredibly bold decision from Valve, and it was. But at the same time, there really wasn't much risk behind this change. Engineer is at his strongest when defending last points, which is also when teleporters are completely worthless. The players that benefited the most from this buff were those that played offensively. Cheaper teleporters mean faster games, which is something that practically everyone can appreciate. Teleporters being cheaper didn't automatically make them easy to keep up, though. All it took was a flanking scout or spy to destroy the entrance at spawn or for that spawn to move, and the engineer would have to run back and set it up again. Man, if only engineers had a way of teleporting themselves back to spawn. Oh, sorry, that's right. Engineers could teleport back to spawn, but only by using the worst wrench in the game. Gunmetal had made the thing usable, but there was still a lot to be desired. That is, until now. Meet Your Match's teleporter buff must have given Valve a eureka moment of their own, because they finally figured out how to make this wrench worth using. As of this update, any teleporters built when using the eureka effect would cost 50% less metal. Entrances and exits would now cost a mere 25 metal each to build. Not only that, but upgrading those teleporters would also cost 50% less, requiring just 100 metal per level instead of 200. Even if you switched off the Eureka effect, any teleporters built using it would retain that cheaper upgrade cost. This new upside synergized perfectly with the ability to teleport to spawn. It was no longer just a tool to use during setup time, although that was absolutely still effective. This new Eureka effect was now a great option for when your teleporters would otherwise be difficult to keep up, especially since its crippling downside was also reduced in this update. Dispensers and ammo pickups would now yield only 20% less metal compared to the previous 50%. Still tough, but manageable. Overall, the Eureka effect was finally in a good spot, giving engineers yet another way to play more actively and creatively. The other changes made to Engineer in this update, however, were not nearly as impactful. The Pompson, which had been dead since Gunmetal, had its close-range damage increased by 10 and its long-range damage decreased by 10. This was possibly an attempt to salvage the weapon, but that would never happen without redesigning it entirely. The Widowmaker, on the other hand, received a buff that was entirely unnecessary. Shooting someone that your sentry was targeting would now result in a 10% damage increase, leading to point-blank shots dealing 99 damage instead of 90. The Widowmaker was already perfect. Why buff it? Well, with the Widowmaker using metal as its ammo source, some Engineer players opted to forego buildings entirely, so this new perk would encourage those players to at least build a sentry before going to town with the Widowmaker. In practice, however, 10% more damage doesn't really make much of a difference. This was a pointless buff, aimed at solving an issue that wasn't really an issue in the first place. Though, I'll be the first to admit it, 
getting that 10% extra damage does make me feel like I'm being rewarded for playing by my sentry, despite knowing that it doesn't really change much. The last weapon to be changed in this update was the Short Circuit, which had its metal cost tweaked for the fifth time. Now, the Short Circuit was back to costing more per projectile yet again. Each shot cost 10 metal, and every projectile destroyed would tack on an additional 5 metal. You can just feel Valve's frustration with this weapon. The concept of zapping projectiles isn't out of place for Engineer, but the design of the weapon itself was not satisfactory. When using the short circuit, you had to keep it out in the face of explosive classes, which meant it was only useful when hiding behind your sentry. Not only was this boring for everyone involved, but the role of the defensive secondary was already occupied by the superior Wrangler. As such, the short circuit would quietly remain in the Wrangler's shadow, despite it being a controversial weapon in its own right. At long last, we've reached Jungle Inferno, TF2's final major update. Dropping in October of 2017, over a year after Meet Your Match, Jungle Inferno brought with it a ton of balance changes. Engineer, however, received the short end of the stick. He was barely changed at all. That made sense though. Valve had given the class a ton of changes over the previous two years. Players were still figuring out how these changes affected Engineer as a whole, but even by 2017, there were no glaring issues with the class. He had a wide variety of playstyles for a specialist, ranging from offense to defense and everything in between. He was still at his most powerful on defense, but that strength was nowhere near what it was at its peak. Valve did it. It only took them 10 years of new balance changes and unlocks, but they finally achieved the version of Engineer that they'd wanted since the game's launch, having the capability to fend for himself and keep up in faster-paced games without also making turtling even stronger. Yep, Engineer was in a perfect state, so Jungle Inferno was nothing more than a victory lap for Valve. The first change made to Engie in this update was doubling the rate that metal was used during setup time, effectively making buildings upgrade twice as fast. Medic's Uber had already been building twice as fast during setup since 2007, so it only made sense for Engie's buildings to do the same. This, when combined with the Eureka effect and the Jag, allowed engineers to have all of their buildings fully upgraded before the gates even opened. It was technically a buff to engineer on defense, but only for defending the first point at the start of the match. And the first points of most attack, defend, or payload maps aren't conducive to turtling due to the lack of choke points or resupply cabinets. Really, all this change does is allow engineers to actually participate in defending the first point without risking getting bum-rushed by any moderately skilled team. There's no way an engineer could stonewall the enemy team for 10 minutes straight on the very first point, so this change was totally fine. The Panic Attack, which had been a fun but gimmicky sidegrade to the shotgun since its tough break buff, was reworked entirely. Its mechanic of holding multiple shots was scrapped, and now it would function much more like the stock shotgun, only with a faster switch speed and a wider spread that increased with successive shots. It was underwhelming at first, but after the buffs given to it in the Blue Moon update a few months later, the Panic Attack proved itself to be a great sidegrade. When accounting for the increased pellets, decreased damage, and wider spread, the Panic Attack dealt more damage than stock at point blank, and less damage past that. Essentially, it was meant to be used as a panic button to get someone out of your face or to finish them off. This was perfect for Pyro and Soldier, who used the Panic Attack as a secondary. As for Engi, who used it as a primary, it was also good. That increased damage at point blank is nothing to scoff at and that faster switch speed is great for when you get caught off guard, like when dealing with spies. This new panic attack was a great addition to Engie's arsenal, though the older and much more interesting panic attack will be sorely missed. Jungle Inferno's final change for Engineer was to the Rescue Ranger, which was finally given a metal cost to its bolts. For the past five years, it had been healing buildings for free which went against what was supposed to be an important skill for engineers, metal management. Now, the Rescue Ranger's healing bolts would consume metal at a 4 to 1 ratio, meaning every 4 health repaired would cost 1 metal. This leads to the maximum of 60 health, costing 15 metal a pop. The Rescue Ranger had been getting away with free healing for so long that this change felt like a massive nerf at first. 
but in reality, it was perfectly reasonable. A 4 to 1 ratio is still better than the wrench's 3 to 1 ratio, on top of being able to heal from any distance like always. The Rescue Ranger was just as good as before Jungle Inferno, only now it would actually require some metal management skills to use effectively. And with that, we've covered everything from Jungle Inferno. Engineer didn't get much, but that was fine. The class was in a great spot. However, there was still something that had not yet been properly addressed. A secondary that, despite several nerfs, was still causing complaints. One that had been making sentry nests frustratingly difficult to break for years. That secondary was none other than… the Short Circuit. It had never been particularly fun to play against or even use, because the design of the weapon forced those using it to hide behind their sentries, lest they be a sitting duck for hitscan classes to easily dispatch. The concept was there, it was the execution that led to the short circuits being so unpopular. Thus, in the Blue Moon update of March 2018, Valve did what no one expected. They turned Engineer into Mega Man. So remember how I'd said earlier that when it comes to balancing problematic unlocks, Valve has a tendency to give up at some point and rework the thing entirely? The Short Circuit was the poster child for this philosophy. In the patch notes, Valve themselves acknowledged that they were tired of tweaking the Short Circuit stats in an attempt to make the original design work. Instead, they opted to overhaul everything. Rather than simply deleting projectiles in front of the engineer like before, the Short Circuit would now launch a projectile-destroying energy ball at the cost of 65 metal. This energy ball travels a short distance before disappearing, deleting any projectiles that it encounters along the way. Just like that, the Short Circuit went from a defensive tool to an offensive one. When it comes to protecting your nest, 65 metal is not worth deleting projectiles that you could otherwise tank and heal off. For protecting yourself, however, that 65 metal can be the difference between life and death. The old short circuit forced players to keep it out, but now that it fires a slow-moving energy ball, you can switch to your shotgun and continue to be protected from projectiles for a short time afterwards. This is an incredibly useful tool for battle engineers, who have historically struggled against demos and especially soldiers. Being on the receiving end of the short circuit is also a bit less frustrating than before, since you can react to the energy ball and either retreat, wait it out, or sidestep it. That's not to say that it's fun to play against, but it's a massive improvement over the previous iteration. Hell, they even fixed the short circuit not letting soldiers rocket jump away. The only issue that remains is being able to spam it from the payload cart, since the cart gives infinite metal and negates the high cost that's supposed to keep the energy ball in check. The short circuit had always been able to do this, but the addition of the energy ball made short circuit spam particularly good, since it can now protect a huge area in front of the cart. All in all, this was an excellent rework for the short circuit. It retained the original concept of deleting projectiles while making it infinitely more engaging to both use and fight against. Finally, we have truly covered every major balance change for the Engineer. It's been over five years since Blue Moon and Jungle Inferno, which has given the player base more than enough time to assess the overall balance of the game. Every single weapon and every possible strategy has been experimented with thoroughly. And over the course of those five years, there's one sentiment regarding TF2's balance that's been shared more than any other. The Wrangler is still fucking overpowered. In the eight years between its release and the Blue Moon update, the Wrangler had been nerfed on three separate occasions, and yet it's still overpowered to this very day. So why didn't Gunmetal's nerf fix the Wrangler for good? Shouldn't the reduced healing nullify the damage resistance of the shield? Well, that reduced healing was only a factor once the sentry has been thoroughly weakened. So you still need to dish out hundreds of damage while withstanding assaults from both the wrangled sentry and the engineer's teammates. And even then, even when the engineer is forced to stop firing and repair his sentry, your team needs to keep applying that constant pressure. The reduced healing technically nullifies the shield in that situation, yes, but that still leaves you with a sentry being healed by an effective 100 health per wrench swing. And if your team stops focusing the sentry at any point, the engineer can fully repair his sentry and put you back at square one. 
So everything that made the Wrangler overpowered defensively when it was first released still applies today. It still forces enemies to exert an unreasonable amount of effort to punish an engineer pressing 2 on his keyboard. If the Wrangler was the only thing that made NG2 strong on defense, then maybe that would be okay. I mean, look at Highlander. Engineers playing at the highest level would have a much harder time accomplishing anything without the Wrangler. A regular 216 health sentry can feel like it's made out of cardboard when fighting a team that knows how to focus it down. When I'd said that the Wrangler was Valve's way of future-proofing the class, this is what I was alluding to. Sentries are limited, sentries are exploitable, and the Wrangler gives engineers some agency over their sentries' fate. Except, Highlander is not the version of TF2 that 99% of people play. There are no class limits in most pubs, which leads me to the next issue with Engineer. Class stacking. Yes, the strategy that's been around since day one is still here, and it's still causing problems. When TF2 first launched, Engineer stacking was not unreasonably difficult to beat. But fast forward to today, and most sentry nests practically require multiple well-timed and well-executed uber pushes. The Wrangler is still overpowered, and Engineer stacking is still too good. But is it the Wrangler itself that's overpowered, or is it only broken without class limits? The existence of Highlander would suggest the latter. And is Engineer stacking really an issue, or is it only too strong when the Wrangler exists? Again, the first three years of the game's life would suggest the latter. But the Wrangler and Engineer stacking are so intertwined that it's impossible to predict what would happen if either of them were changed, which is perhaps why Valve stopped where they did. In any case, it could definitely be a lot worse. And after over 15 years of new unlocks and balance changes, this is the state that Engineer remains in today. So how has Engineer evolved since TF2's release? Engineer has always been a powerful defender due to the design of the Sentry, which has gone relatively unchanged between 2007 and today. Boasting perfect aim and high DPS, a Sentry can mow down anyone that carelessly walks into its line of sight, regardless of that player's skill level. Such immediate power necessitated equally powerful counterplay, which Valve provided in spades. The Sentry's low health, slow turning speed, and immunity to fall off allowed anyone to make it past the Sentry if given the opportunity. Demo and Medic in particular were explicitly designed to break the stalemates that Engineer would otherwise cause. From the very start, Engineer was well balanced. He was strong on defense, but he also had his counters. This binary approach to class balance, however, resulted in the actual playing of the class feeling frustrating and mind-numbing. Those that wanted to play Engineer effectively without turtling had to give up on upgrading or even protecting their sentries. Valve's only goal for NG has been to enable more active gameplay without making turtling even stronger. The Engineer update of 2010 gave players a handful of new offensive options to experiment with, but with the release of the Wrangler and several other unlocks over the following two years, Valve was unwittingly giving Engineer everything he needed to bring games to a screeching halt, which reached its peak with the release and subsequent buff of the Rescue Ranger in 2013. It took a few years for Valve to realize the full extent to which players were abusing these weapons, but the Gunmetal and Tough Break updates of 2015 brought several nerfs that scaled NG's defensive capabilities back. These updates, as well as Meet Your Match in 2016, also compensated for those nerfs by blessing Engineer with a long list of buffs that fleshed out the class's playstyles beyond Sterling. Jungle Inferno and the Blue Moon update continued this trend further, ultimately leaving Engineer with a wide range of offensive options to choose from. But with the Wrangler still being overpowered, Engineer is therefore still a bit too strong on defense, exacerbated further by class stacking being as powerful as always. Oh, and the Southern Hospitality has been one of the wrenches of all time. This class, like any other, has been through both highs and lows over the years. Is Engineer more balanced now than he's been in the past? Like always, leave any thoughts and suggestions you might have in the comments. Until next time, thanks for watching.